Welcome to the Tribe of Testimonies. Here you will find conversations with faithful Native American members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, sharing their stories and their love of the Savior. My name is Andrea Hales. I'm Navajo, and I'm glad that you've decided to come and join us today. I am on the phone tonight with Sister Nancy Bearcloud. I already cried. I offered a prayer, and I cried already, and I don't usually cry this soon in a conversation, so... Something is going to be awesome tonight. Uh, Nancy, would you please introduce yourself in your tribal way? And if it's in your language, great. If it's not, that's fine. Not everybody speaks their language, and some languages are dead. Hey, Nancy, speak. I'm here tonight speaking with Andrea about anything she asked me about the spirituality that I just went through and experienced. I am from the Upsalika Nation, and in English, it's Crow, which is down here in southeastern Montana. Um, I was raised here. Um, I was born up north in my mom's tribe, which is the Grove on Assiniboine tribe, but I'm more cultural with my father's Crow tribe. And... Of course, being a native, I came from two worlds because my family, they have a lot of um, influence with our cultural ways in the Crow. And then being raised and born into the Mormon church, I had that also. So I grew up confused, but now I'm not confused anymore. (laughs) Yeah, so... um... Would you, Nancy, would you share something that you love about your heritage as it relates to the gospel of Jesus Christ? It can be pretty much anything, a story, a celebration, a way of life, a ceremony. What do you love about your heritage as it relates to the gospel? As growing up as a Crow member and learning our spirituality, that's what I loved. Because there was always prayer. There was always a ceremony practice to help us through our way of life and um like for instance we had our we had our sun dance which people would go in and pray for healing and pray for other people and they would um they would uh what do we call it fast they would fast for three days and they would camp under the element in a circle with other sun dancers. And um, there were other parts and ceremonial rituals with that, that, you know, wasn't really necessary because I participated when I was in my early twenties. And when you're in a sun dance, you, you go for four years to complete it. And I did. And every time I went in, it was for my knowledge to know how much faith I had in myself and faith in God. And um, the first year was pretty intense, but I I made it through 74, 74 hours of the elements of the earth and fasting. I thought I was going to get hungry, but I was more thirsty than anything. And sleeping under the stars with all these other sun dancers under the circle of trees that they built. And it was really beautiful. It was a little intense, but beautiful because everything they did, they were praying and dancing and praising God and doing all these um, ceremonial things to... uh, help us pray for the people that we went in there for. But I I didn't go in there for anybody but me because I was, like I said, I was living in two worlds and I come from a long line of sun dancers. And when I went in my last year of it, I had a real spiritual experience. Um, there was this part of the sun dance where they drug buffalo skulls from the back they would pierce the back (laughs) and I saw my friend from New York she was from a tribe from New York that came to do uh to participate with my family Sundance and oh my gosh that poor gal 
those pins did not break. She drugged those skulls three-fourths away around that circle. And me and my cousin were dancing behind her to give her support. And it was very hard to watch because it just pulled her skin and her face was disoriented. And you could see the pain and struggle. And I looked at my cousin and told her, I said, I'll never do this. <laughs> no way. <laughs> But it's funny anyway, you shouldn't speak too soon because my fourth year, I don't know why, but um, that my cousin, he was the ringleader and he came by and he said, all right, ladies, who wants to drag skulls? And I, I put my hand up instantly, which was so weird. And I just looked at my mom all wide eyed and she just said, you can do it. And I was like, oh, no. And the first thing that came to my mind was my friend from New York. But I just, I let that leave me because that was doubt trying to enter to me. So they came and got me and took me out of the circle and brought me in through the front entrance and sat me down on a buffalo robe by the pole. And um, these medicine men came with these huge eagle feathers and they were praying all around me. And um, after they prayed, there was a man that came and he cut two slits in the back of my dress right around my shoulder blade bones um, in the back part. And <clears throat> anyways, I never felt a thing. All I felt was like a light touch, a really light touch. I didn't realize they cut my skin and they put those, pier uh, those little sticks, those little piercing sticks underneath and tied it up and with buckskin and then they tied it to the buffalo skulls and they got me up and they took me up to the tree and I started they said pray pray to your creator and ask for strength so I did I I, I was saying my prayers and um, then they pulled me back after I was done and they led me over to where we were going to exit out of that circle in the entrance because what you do is you exit once that drum starts beating you start you start pulling and it was funny because the guy that danced next to me on my right was from Canada he was a big medicine man from there and he said all right sister he goes take a run at it <laughs> so I blew my whistle and focused on the mountain and I took a dead run at it and here one popped right away and flew. I seen it go over my head. I mean, and it was really kind of weird. And the other one pulled me back and I was like, oh, she, I said the S word. And I was like, looked at him like, oh no, I cussed. <laughs> Cause I was like, I shouldn't be cussing in such a spiritual realm. But anyways, he just laughed. He said, it's okay. It's okay. So they, they were praying for me and they brought it in four times to me and they said, all right, sister, take another run at it. And it was so crazy because I don't know, it was such a spiritual moment that when I took two steps, that thing popped off my back and we went out in sequence out of the circle dancing to the four seasons. And it, it was just amazing. My mom said it was the most beautiful sight she's ever seen because when I turned, they all turned with me. When I stepped, they all stepped with me. And I, I didn't know I had a cousin there that was from my dad's tribe coming to our medicine lodge, which was over in my mom's tribe. Well, this girl, she was my little alter ego. We didn't get along. And I mean, we weren't, we weren't ugly to each other. We just had like hard feelings I don't know why just teenage stuff but it was so funny because I was when I finished the Sundance and got out my mom was so proud of me my grandpa everybody was so proud because I broke before we left the circle and to me that was me being told that I had more faith than I ever knew and I I was so happy with the accomplishment but my cousin when I was walking out of there, she came crying. And I thought, where'd you come from? <laughs> and she was just crying and she just hugged me. And she said, oh, Nancy, I didn't know you had so much strength. She goes, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. 
you were the last person I would ever see do something this spiritual and to just be so accomplished with it. She was just going on and on. And I was just standing there like, yeah, but you never liked me. (laughs) (laughs) Why are you crying? (laughs) But, you know, like our tribe were really heavily into the Sundance culture. And that was back in 96, I want to say, or 97 that I did that. And, um, you know, but in the back of my mind, I was all, I always had the Mormon church on my thoughts and what Heavenly Father probably wouldn't like um, me doing, participating in our tribal cultural ceremonies. But, you know, it was, um, like I said, I was stuck in two worlds. But the <laughs> more I got involved <clears throat> and the more I did my scripture studies and started to learn more about our religion, our Mormon religion, and I started to feel happy because I found so many connections, many connections. The one thing that kind of made me laugh when I read the Book of Mormon, it said, <laughs> we had lost our ways and there's ways that there was going to be practice that was going to be like silly. And the first thing that came to my mind was, um, was the smudging. And um, I found out that mosquitoes don't like sage. And I thought, geez, we really smudge heavily. And I thought, maybe in a joking way, one of the native descendants way back was probably telling someone why they smudge and they're really smudging to keep the mosquitoes away. But then they told them, oh, this is going to carry our spirit, our prayers up and uh, keep the bad spirits away. I'm like, maybe the mosquitoes were the bad spirits. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know why I thought that. But, you know, I wasn't trying to be disrespectful to our own cultural way. But I thought, yeah, I bet there was a real kind of character native that took it to another level when reality it was just to keep the mosquitoes away because we always camp by the river (laughs) but i don't know it's kind of my my brain thinks weird sometimes (laughs) but anyways you know like if you think about the things that we do culturally we have our sun dance ceremony We have our sweat lodge, we have our journey, and we have our adoptions. It's just, um, it's there's just too many some similarities between the Mormon Church and some of our Native ways, and it's just like they almost had it right. You know, they had it right in the beginning, and then down the line, it got all changed, and I felt really good about that after I read the Book of Mormon and thought, you know, cause I was always thinking about why is our cultural ceremony so wrong and these Christians are so right, but not all of them, you know? I, I went to other churches. I never felt what I feel when I go to our church. I never feel the connection, the reality of the true church. And then after reading the Book of Mormon, it really came to life for me. And what really captivated me to know that our descendants were the ones that wrote this book was when they described how some of the Lamanites would dress and wear paint on their heads and shear their heads and their skin. I thought, wow, some of those natives still do that. You know, they still wear that distinctive style and I thought yep this this is true this this is really true this was really written by our descendants and and it made me want to know more and go further back past Lehi to the rest of our genealogy and I found it 
And when I found it, I was like, whoa, I was so astonished. I thought, man, this blood has been flowing far back as that, all the way to the coat of many colors and further. I thought, yep, Heavenly Father did keep his promise. And, you know, and that's more concrete validation for me to build my faith on. But, and then I just, um, I try to share and it's like, some of them get excited and some of them are like really in doubt and question and they fail to believe it. I'm like, okay, it's okay. I, I'm not offended because you know what? This is what I learned is if I wanna know the truth, all I have to do is ask. You just get down and pray go to your closet and pray and ask him and he will reveal it to you if it's in your real true to desire to know the truth. That's, that's the part that's kind of a challenge because not everybody wants to know the truth because they're afraid. And there's nothing really to be afraid of. I have a lot, a lot of stories in my life when it comes to our religion. You said you were raised as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but it sounds like there was a time when you weren't active in the church. Is that, am I, am I picking that up right? Yes, you are. Because like I said, I lived in two worlds and um, when we were growing up, I had a very difficult life with uh, abuse, not physical abuse my dad and mom were workaholics and my dad on the weekend was a was a social alcoholic so all week go to school do our chores my dad was a coal miner worked monday through friday 12 hour shifts my mom worked two jobs so we barely saw her all the only time we ever saw my mom was sleeping on the couch and um on her days off she would she was at home doing things and cooking these meals and because all week long it was mostly uh, me and my two brothers and my father because he would get home before mom <clears throat> and sometimes he would like tell us things about the book of mormon and um about church and about how it came into our life and um but the thing was is that it was repetitious uh, it was go to school, do our chores. My mom and dad would be gone before we would leave to school because they both worked at four in the morning. And um, so it was just me and my two siblings that I'd have to get them going. And, um, but then it was crazy because when Friday would come, my dad would come home and be happy as a polecat, play his music loud, and get ready. and give us our allowance and take off and be gone for two days. And then sometimes we'd wake up and we'd be standing room only in our house, you know, all the, all the drinking and party. And I'd call my mom and she'd come get us and take us to a motel. And, you know, and that was, that was like all from when I was a little kid until I was 17 years old. But the thing was, is that even though my dad was like that, we went to church every Sunday. I mean, my dad would be hungover and he'd take us and it had a lot to do with his mom because my grandma, she was a very active member and loved the church more than anything in the world. And, you know, and her kids, my dad and my two aunts, it was never miss a beat on Sunday. You know, my dad never wanted to make his mom cry so he would go even though he lived in two worlds an alcoholic and then the Mormon church so when my parents got divorced when I was 17 it all stopped no more church my grandma was gone my aunt was my one of my aunts moved away my other aunt was having her own marital issues so it wasn't really there anymore the being active and you know, me and my brothers, we, we would go to seminary. We went on scripture chases. I even went on placement program. I begged to go. I was like, oh, yeah, I will heck a go on placement 
<laughs> but I'm the only girl out of all these boys. And my dad was very stingy. I had to beg him and my mom had to talk to him. So they finally let me go. I left when I was 16 or 15 and I went to Idaho and I finished two grades in one year. I was living in a fully active Mormon home and I was loving every moment of it. And it all came to an end when my parents decided to get a divorce. But, you know, I got a lot out of it. It stuck with me what I learned there. And it's so funny because my foster mom, when um, I was there probably, probably like about six months, she came to me with a book from, that was written by a Navajo and it talked about giving up my culture to be a Mormon or something. I can't, I can't remember what the name of the book was, but I thought it was really interesting. I kind of got offended by it, but then I thought, why am I getting offended? My, my foster mom's just trying to show me it's okay, you know, at that time to let go. I didn't understand, but I understand now. And, um, but yeah, after coming back from placement program and dealing with my parents and you know, my mom worked all the time. She wasn't really an alcoholic. But after she left my dad and divorced him, she started to drink and run around and go to college. And here I am with these two little boys again, my brothers. Well, they weren't so little. It's just I had my own life. I was in high school. And, yeah, and I had to take care of my two brothers because my mom was lost and my dad was really lost. And, I just went away to boarding school. I left. I finally left and went to boarding school and I didn't go to church for, I think, two years. And then my mom was having too many problems with me because I just really didn't, it was, I was living with a person I didn't know. She was drinking and had all these friends and um, my brothers were always constantly with me. So I would fight with my mom and my dad. He wasn't much help. And um, it was crazy because my mom shipped me off to Fort Belknap with my grandpa and my grandma. I ain't no dummy. I wasn't going to be dumb around them. I love my grandpa. <laughs> he was an old cowboy. <laughs> you don't mess with that man. So I was there for a few months, but they were Baptists. But they never hardly went to church. So I still wasn't going to church. Um, but it wasn't, it never left my mind. You know, I missed it. It was a part of my life, my whole life. And I missed it. And, you know, and I would wonder when I would ever be participating again. But um, after my grandpa called my mom and said, Ann, there ain't nothing wrong with this girl. I'm sending her home. So they sent me home. And the next thing I know, I'm at my uncle's ranch. And I wasn't about to mess with that man either because he was an ex-Marine uh, uh, ex drill sergeant. <laughs> also, my name was Maggot every morning. <laughs> get up, Maggot. Go get them horses. I was like, what the heck? And my cousins were like, shut up, Dad. <laughs> you know, and they were Catholic. <laughs> so. I stayed with them for four months working out on the ranch and helping out and being called maggot, <laughs> you know, but my, if he wasn't calling me maggot, he was calling me girl. And it was like funny. I really loved my uncle. He was such a big cowboy, and you know, and I don't know. I, I, um, I went home finally and my mom and dad, I was really sick and I was at home and my mom and dad went out it was the weekend and here my brother my older brother's friend came over and he found me downstairs and he was like Nancy you need to get up he goes your mom and dad are both at the same bar and it doesn't look good I was like oh my gosh so I got up and it was like midnight and I went over there and found my parents and my dad's girlfriend was driving my mom's car and my mom lost her lid and she drug her out of that car and found my dad's truck and rammed it with me in it. And I was like, oh, my gosh, my mom really lost it. So there was a big old bar fight. And I couldn't take it no more. I couldn't take my mom and dad. And I fought my dad, which was a no-no. And my 
stepmom came in and tried to attack me and you know I just dealt with them people and I was really upset with my mom and I was getting after her and she took me home and dropped me off with her wrecked car and so I couldn't do it no more and after that the next day when she sobered up she tried to talk to me and I just sat there and let her talk I didn't say anything and um she goes I'm gonna call your aunt I go I guess why would you want to call her she's all the way in California well she called my aunt and um she came back to me the next day and said well you better pack your stuff you're going to California I was like, what? What is this lady doing now? And I was just going to be turning 18. And so I <clears throat> packed my stuff, didn't argue with her, went and saw my dad, apologized to him, and he apologized to me. I go, I guess I'm going to California because mom can't handle me. And he said, yep. He goes, you used to live there when you were a baby. And I thought, really? He goes, that's where Grandma Marianne's at. And I'm like, who's that? Well, I didn't, little did I know my Grandma Marianne was a full-fledged Mormon. And she met my grandpa through the church. And I was like, oh. And so I was really happy. I was like, yeah, I'll go to California. <laughs> so when I was 18, I left and ended up in California. And I never saw my grandma since I was one years old, I guess. And she was just ecstatic to have me there. And my great grandma was still alive. She was 90 some years old. And my grandma was the secretary for the Bishop storehouse. And <clears throat> so it was really cool because I went over there and there was like a whole warehouse with the factory ever set up. And I was like, wow. She goes, yep, they come here and do their canning and you know, and they get their food here. And I was like, oh, that's awesome, Grandma. That's awesome to have a job like that. I didn't know the Mormon church did that. So after going there, I went back to church. I was fully active again. I was going to school. I had a job. My, la my life was just gravy. And it felt really good. But then a part of me was, the Native part of me was missing Montana missing my way of life, which wasn't good because I was, I learned everything, you know, from what my parents did, drinking and running around. I was a functional addict and I worked all the time, but still I went to church. But I, when I first got there, it wasn't so much like that. I was more into church and working, but. Um, so how long were you in California with your grandmother? I was there for 33 years. I just moved home four years ago. Oh. Yeah. I My grandma passed in 94. And then I got married down there to my first husband. And um, I tried to bring him into the church. I didn't force him or nothing. I took him to church with me <laughs> on fast Sunday. And when we went home, I said, so what did you think? Because that was the first time. When he went, I thought, you know what? I'm going to bear my testimony. Not to show off, but I was so happy that my husband wanted to go to church with me because he was a Catholic. And I thought, you know what? This is the time for me to bear my testimony. I just feel like I should. So I went up and it was the longest walk ever from the shortest distance. And it was so heavy. And I was like, oh, my gosh, can I do this? <laughs> I got up there and cried before I even talked. And I looked, I go, wow, that was the longest walk. <laughs> it was the spirit. The spirit was so heavy over me. And my husband was sitting back there with my two daughters. And I was just, like, focusing on him. And he was just looking up and watching me. And the whole congregation was sitting there quietly and I bore my testimony and I felt really good. You know, I, I accomplished it. I was like, man, it took me long enough. I was probably about 20, mm, probably about 27 years old when I did my, bear my first testimony. And so when we went home, my husband was like sitting there and I go, so what do you think of church? I was so super excited. And he was like, oh man you Mormons are something else. He goes, you guys brag too much about yourselves. 
You don't even talk about Jesus or God. <laughs> oh, no. And I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, yeah, he got blocked. <laughs> <laughs> He wasn't getting the concept. <laughs> so I was like, never mind. <laughs> we didn't last too long. He wasn't a faithful husband. And um, I wasn't really too hurt about it because after that church moment, I thought, yeah, he's going to make it hard for me to achieve getting married in the temple and being a Mormon family and I wasn't too sad when I found out that he was cheating on me. I just really lost all hope of having that Mormon family that I got to experience when I went on placement program. Because being in that household and seeing my parents and the way the kids were and the activities and the organization in the household, I wanted that. I wanted that for me and my future family. And it wasn't something new because I always wanted it since I was a kid. And um, and then my second husband, he um he was a meth addict. I was stuck in that cycle of addiction, marrying people and being the um the supporter, the sole supporter. And, you know, he never really said much about me being Mormon or anything. And um, I went through a lot in that 15 years of marriage. And I, <clears throat> I was going to church off and on, but I was still living in a, a, a substance abuse world and then trying to be a Mormon with my seven daughters. And, you know, it's, um, it was a struggle, but it was really crazy because... Um, he actually converted and it was only after I got arrested for his stupidity. <laughs> he thought, I know exactly what he was thinking. He was thinking, Oh no, I better do something drastic to keep her and make her happy. And when he told me he wanted to join the church, when I got out of jail, I just was like, I smiled so big, but then I thought, wait, why are you doing this? I hope you're doing it for you and not for me. He goes, no, no. He goes, you know, he goes, I've been really praying and Heavenly Father's been talking to me and I need to do this. And I'm like, okay. So we did. We went through the whole thing and he got baptized and became a Mormon. And um, it lasted a whole three months. I said, wow. And he told me he couldn't do it no more because something in his class that he was being taught, um, he didn't agree with, he didn't believe, for, you know, and I was like, and he never told me what it was. And I was kind of like really sad because this was the person I wanted to spend the rest of my life with. And here um, that happened and I knew it was, I knew it was gonna happen. But I thought, you know what, I'm done. I left that marriage and I've been out of it for seven years now. And I just been focusing on me. I lost a daughter 12 years ago. And that's when I really threw myself back into devotion to the church. I don't practice anything with my tribe ceremonies anymore. I don't um I don't ever just pray and say, a ho, a ho means thank you. I always say in the name of Jesus Christ, the way we're supposed to. Um, I do things the way that Heavenly Father intended us to do by the teachings of Jesus's gospel, which was given to our ancestors, you know, many, many years ago and how it went through the grapevine and got twisted and lost. And now we have it back. And then now I stopped listening to my elders in my tribe. They're like always saying, oh, you don't want to read that book. It was written by those white people and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay. 
I go, them people that wrote that book were not white. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, why don't you read it and you will find out. (laughs) I thought, oh my gosh. (laughs) They really, some of these people really make me laugh. I don't say nothing or get disrespectful or offended because we're not supposed to, because they do have to find out on their own. We're just supposed to set the seed, even though we feel we haven't. We did. We've set the seed. And me being this way, um, I come across so many people because I'm such a people person. I just love to gab and find out so much about people that work with me. And there was this young man and he was talking to me and um, I pray for our food all the time, the majority of the time, because I'm a culinary chef supervisor for the elder care and I have a crew and I always pray for food because I always think about um, when Jesus was on the mountain was serving all them people and they all got served by his prayer and by the faith. And so one day I was at work and my kitchen manager was freaking out and she was frantic and I don't think we have enough food and blah, blah, blah. We're going to run out and, She goes, and I don't know what I'm going to do because we were feeding five cottages, which had 15 residents each. And then we were feeding the independent care, which 60 people were in there, but only 30 would come down. Then we had TRC. And at that time, there was like maybe 24 people. And then we had wing four, which was 40 people. So that's quite a bit to cook for. And so I told her I said Margie did you pray and she said pray why would I pray right now and I said no did you pray for the food and she said no and I said oh well don't you remember when Jesus prayed that there was enough food and she goes yeah I know and then she just kind of like blew it off so I stepped over and I got in front of the stove and I started praying for the food and she came over and she's like, what are you doing? You know, she's all in my ear. I'm praying. And she's like, what are you doing? Are you okay? Why is your eye closed? <laughs> and she goes, Why are you holding your hands? Like that? It's, like, it's only obvious I'm praying. <laughs> Shh, quiet. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I didn't say nothing. I just kept praying and I finished and I looked at her and she goes, are you okay? And I go, yeah, Margie, I was praying for the food. And she goes, okay, you do that. (laughs) (laughs) So I was like, she's silly. And so I went up and serviced and we took all the food out and got everything going. And um, after everything was said and done, I emptied all the um, hot tables and took all the trays down with all the food. And there was like probably a fourth of it left in each pan. And I went and I said, Margie, look at the cart. And she goes, yeah. She goes, just put it on the dish rack. I go, no, Margie, come here, look. And she looked at it and I go, do you see all that food left over? And she goes, yep. I go, see the power of the prayer. And then she stopped and she goes, oh. And she just smiled. She smiled after that, which was enough for me, you know. And so it's funny, ever since that day, I pray all the time for our food. And one day, my coworker, she said, Nancy, you know, when you're up here praying for the food, did you notice we all stop and get quiet and watch you? (laughs) She goes, we wait till you're done, and then we start doing our work. I said, that is so awesome. You should say, (laughs) join me next time. Oh, yeah. I should. I never thought of that. But, you know, everybody in my job knows I'm very spiritual and I'm always praying and I have I have such a big heart. I love to do what I can for everyone, you know, and just involve God as much as I can through Jesus's name, because, you know, it's a very delicate place where I work and the people I work with are from all denominations. Nancy, I recently heard 
the person that I talked to said that you had recently gone through the temple. Would you tell us about how that was for you? Like, how did you get there and what have you learned? And uh, tell us, just tell us about it. Well, Brother Jorgensen, he got me on this journey. And it was something that was already planted in my head. And we got to, we got through the, we got through repentance. Oh my gosh. That was two and a half months of trying to, me trying to spill it all out. (laughs) And we finally got through the repentance. So, and then he said, well, now we'll work on your baptismal part temporary baptismals. So we worked on that and I achieved that. And I was so super happy because Brother Jorgensen was there to baptize me with all the, well, it well, first it started with 24 names, but there was a young gal there and I gave her half. Uh-huh. So I did 12 and she did 12. And I was happy to share. I was just happy to be and, there. And these are your excited. family names, right? No, no. The first names that were given to me from were from all the church members. Oh, cool. I didn't get to. Yeah. And it was funny because like one of my adopted dad family members, their their name was in there. And I felt really good. I was like, oh, man, I'm baptizing for a grass. That's cool because they love my dad, you know, oh. and I was I was just like really ecstatic that I got to do one of the grass family members. And um. But yeah, it was really an amazing moment because they asked me, are, now, are you going to be okay? Because that you're going to be in water for a long time. I go, I'm a fish. I love to swim. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was so funny because Brother Jorgensen's really tall and I'm really short. And that water came to my shoulders and it was like at his waist or something. And, <laughs> and he's like trying to dunk me. And at first it was kind of chaotic because my legs went all over and I was trying to pull myself up and we, he dunked me 12 times. And then by the eighth one, I was, I finally had it. My feet were planted. I was going back, coming up and just smiling every time, but it was an amazing experience. And especially to have brother Jorgensen there and, um, we did the confirmations and uh, it was just a great experience. I was so happy. I couldn't wait to go back. And then, um, and then he said, okay, we're going to work on, we're going to work on later your endowments and your initiatories. And I thought, Oh my gosh, that would be so amazing if I could get to that. So like three months later, he um, said we were supposed to have an appointment, but Unfortunately, he his calling ended as branch president and he was going home. And I thought and I was working so much that I wasn't going to church as much as I should have been. And I missed out on a lot. And I told him, I said, what's going on? You're leaving? And he said, yeah, my calling's done. We're going back to Nebraska. I said, now who am I supposed to talk to? And he goes, Brother Lind. I go, I don't know him. <laughs> So he goes, he's really good. And then I was like, okay. So I, um, it was just a couple of weeks later after brother Jorgensen and the family left, I made an appointment to talk to brother Lind and we talked about what me and Jorgensen had planned. And he said, well, he goes, well, let me ask you these questions. And the one question that came up was tithing. I said, no, I said, I haven't actually been paying for a couple months. And he goes, well, let's get that in order. He goes, let's shoot for July 20th. And this was back in late May. And I said, okay, yes, that will work. So I had the two months to get myself in order with tithing, which I did. And um, I was so excited because I had my second interview. And we he asked me all those questions and asked me about tithing. And I said, yes, everything's in order. So he goes, okay, July 20th. He goes, now you have to call them. He goes, and you need to make an appointment, but you got to talk to the stake president first. And so he made an appointment with the stake president, which was a week later. And I um, had my interview and everything just went great. And he gave me my temple recommend for my endowments and my initiatories. 
and everybody in the church knew what I was doing because I would always bring it up during fast and t- uh, testimony day. I'm like, oh my gosh, okay, I'm getting close. I'm almost there, you know, (laughs) and everyone was so supportive and everybody kept coming in up. Nancy, when you go, we want to be there. Let us know when your date comes up. And then the missionaries that were there previously, when Jorgensen's were there, they were brother and sister Silcock from Idaho and they were from Incom. And I was so super excited to learn that these people were coming from Income because that's where I went to placement. No. And I was like, yeah, yeah isn't that crazy? That, <laughs> and, and that is like, a tender mercy <laughs> right there. Right. And here I was excited to meet them and ask them if they knew my parents and, you know, and I was just ecstatic. And when they came, I went right up to Sister Silcock and I said, introduce myself. And I said, you know, I said, I went to school. I said, I, I lived in income. And she goes, you did. And I go, my foster mom, her name was Karen Davis. And she goes, you're kidding. I said, no. I said, I lived with them, her and Arnold. And she goes, oh my gosh. She goes, I know your mother and your father. She goes, they are really good friends. And they live right around the corner from us. And I was like, really? I was like, oh my gosh. So they became my um, teachers to prepare me for the temple. And um, I told them when it was time for me to go for my endowments and in stories, I would like them to be there. And I also said that to Brother Jorgensen. And he, I go, would you come? And he goes, yeah. I go, all the way from Nebraska? He goes, yep, just let us know. So in the last month, it's been just really chaotic because I all my steps have been happening right in place. And I went to California in June for my oldest daughter's graduation. And Sister Silcock came for a visit. And I go, how's my mom and dad? She goes, oh, she fell. She's not doing so good. So I said, oh, no. So I told my mom, my real mom, I said, mom, on our way back, can we go through income? I said, because I need to see my mom and dad. I said, oh, the missionary lady told me that they weren't doing well. And she goes, yeah, we can do that. But my intention was I wanted to invite them. And even though, (laughs) so, and Sister Silcock knew that. She goes, I'm not saying nothing. She goes, when you go there, she goes, you make sure and ask her. And so I did. I went over there. My mom and dad were so happy to see me. And they finally got to meet my real mom and dad and um, my stepdad. And they were just ecstatic. And I said, you know, mom, I said, I came to check on you because um, Sister Selcock said you fell. And she goes, oh, yeah, but I'm OK. I'm a little wobbly. You know, she's 76 years old and my foster dad's 80. And um Anyways, I said, well, I wanted to let you both know that I'm going through to get my endowments and niche stories. I said, and I want you guys to come. And my foster mom was so happy. She goes, oh, yes, you let us know. You let us know right away and find us a motel. And, you know, they were just really happy. So I came home and got everything ready. And um, it was so crazy because they came. My foster parents came the day before. The Silcox came the day before. Brother Jorgensen came the day before. About maybe a fourth of the congregation was there. When I made the appointment, they said, you have to make a different appointment because the one you want is filled and there's only two spots. I said, oh, no, that won't work. (laughs) I said, okay, well. What's your other time? And she said, 1130. There's 92 spots. I go, that will work. Okay, we'll do that. (laughs) And it was so awesome. Everybody but my branch president got to go. And um, when I got there, I got my dress, I got my attire, and my mom had stuff for me. She was so, she goes, go to the bookstore, find out what size you wear in garments, and I'll get everything ready and bring it. And she did. So um, it was so special to me because when we went in and I got dressed and we went into, after I got done with doing the first part of it and um, going into the other room and learning, you know, the beginning and we're sitting there and my mom gave me my bag with my apron and my 
veil and my sash. And I, she was sitting by me and Sister Sita Clock was sitting by me. And um, I was sitting there. And then when it was time for me to get dressed, I stood up and my mom, for as shaky as she was, she got me ready. I felt like I was being dressed for a wedding. I was just... I just had the most comfortable feeling and so much love in that room. Every time I turned to look, somebody was smiling with glee. And I was like, I had fought really hard to keep my tears back because I didn't want to cry. And especially watching my mom getting me dressed and she was so frail. And I thought, man, she's just fighting to do this for me. And I was just so blessed. And Sister Silcock helping my mom and then um we sat down and i felt pure comfort like i was just hugged by the softest embrace just felt so comfortable and so protective and i thought wow this is amazing this is a feeling i've been waiting for all my life and you know to have my foster mom there and to have sister silcock there and everybody from church it was just really really special and I just kept thanking God and thinking about my daughter on the other side and my family I thought wow they're all probably just smiling and so one thing my aunt who passed away that was really the biggest part of my life keeping me in the church she always said Nancy whenever you go through one of the things in the Mormon church, like when I got my patriotical blessing, she said, you walk in there and you walk in there with a smile because they're all there. They're all there to witness. And I did. I went in and got my patriotical blessing with the biggest smile. And it was really an amazing spiritual moment. And then to go through the next, I would always smile. I would always remember what my aunt said. They're there to witness. You, you don't see them, but they're there. So I would do that. And then when we finally got into the last part of it, when we'd go through the veil, um, they took everybody before me. My mom, my foster dad, Brother Jorgensen, his wife, the Silcox, and some of the church members. <clears throat> and I was just sitting there smiling, just waiting, not sure what was going to happen or if I could say the things they were telling us. And I was just really had all kinds of random thoughts and I was more curious about the other side, what I was going to see. And when it came to that moment and they opened that for me to let me in, the first person I saw was brother Jorgensen with the biggest smile on his face. And then I saw my mom and dad and I thought, Oh my gosh, this is what it's going to be like when I cross over. And I thought, oh, wow, Heavenly Father, that's the validation right there that I truly needed because I miss my baby every day, every day. And now I know it's okay. And my heart doesn't hurt so much anymore. And it's just like, it was the best decision I ever made to let go of the natural man's life. It was the best decision I made to lean on my Mormon ways and to walk away from my cultural ways and the spirituality. And I found the truth. I found the truth to how we should be praising Heavenly Father and how we should be living. And, you know, I, it doesn't make me think any different of my cultural ways at all. I thought, wow, they almost had me. <laughs> they almost had me. You know, I I just um, really love everything about the Mormon church. And I'm really grateful that we have a prophet today because I listen to him all the time and all his disciples. And I hear messages more and more now that my heart desire is to have that wisdom so that when I'm ready to go on my mission now, um, I will have every answer 
that I think would be ready available for the people that I want to bring back into the church. And it's just beautiful. Okay, Nancy, this, I like, I know I told you at the beginning I was crying and now I'm crying again. So, (laughs) (laughs) but I have one final question for you. What does it mean to you to know that you belong to the tribe of Israel? Oh my gosh. Now that it's been proven to me by my own research and then enlightened, I'm ecstatic. I'm really ecstatic to know that we go further than here and who we truly belong to, what our actual culture is, to have that knowledge. And it's like, what the heck? And because I heard a couple of years, well, a few years back, I heard when they did all that DNA testing on those, uh, what were they, the um, uh, Cherokees, and how they found Hebrew blood or something, and they were confused. <laughs> how? And they were like, yeah. It's- yeah. It's, it's, we already know. (laughs) Yeah. It's like, I'm like, that's awesome that they did that because these natives really think that they were here first and this is where they've always been. But in my heart, because I grew up in the church, I knew that there was more truth to it and that we didn't really just come from here. We came from further than that. So I just, I'm, I'm happy and ecstatic to know the truth, you know, and I can't wait to share it with everybody. And I have been, I've been sharing it with a lot of people that listen and they just look at me like, really? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. I said, you know, us natives, we weren't always here and this is who we belong to. This is our true bloodline. And it's, they, they kind of get that curiosity look in their face like hmm like they want to know more and when I see that I'm like ready to just spill the beans (laughs) (laughs) and then I'll actually look at scripture for them to look and see that I am speaking the truth so I mean it's it's exciting it's really super exciting I can't wait until I bring my first actual person to the church that um, converts or um, is ready to learn more from me and believe the things I have to say. So, you know, it's um, a very exciting time for me right now because like when I tell people about everything I've done and that I want to go on a mission because that's my next big step, they're like, oh, I wonder where they'll send you. I go, I don't know. I don't really care, but to just go on a mission because that's what I always wanted to do and to have the knowledge of where I, who I am and where I come from and my descendant tree and what, you know, why we were the chosen ones. It's just like, wow, you know, I, I don't feel so much doubt about myself. I'm not so hard on myself anymore. And it's like, yep, that truth came out and I believed and I found evidence and I was given the concrete answer. So, yeah, I love that I'm a part of Israel because it is such a strong, strong spiritual race and place, actually. Yeah. Thank you so much. I have super, super duper appreciated this time together. Oh, me too. I couldn't wait. When Brother Jorgensen called and asked me, I was like, yes. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I like to hear myself talk. (laughs) 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 He just laughed. (laughs) But I want to tell you in my language, that means thank you, my friend. I was just so happy to talk to Nancy. Um, there are small miracles in my life every once in a while that I'm, I need to remember. 
And finding Nancy was one of those. I Sometimes I have a bunch of people in line to do interviews. And sometimes I'm like, I don't have anybody. Well, this week I was thinking about it. And um, I didn't have anybody. And I, I was like, oh, I should contact Brother Jorgensen again. Because I've contacted him in the past and he like almost immediately replied, oh yeah, I know this person. She, You should talk to her. And so I didn't talk to her that day. I talked to her the next day and she's like, well, I was waiting for you. And I hope you feel God's love through Nancy. Because this is what I felt through Nancy. That God loves us. That he is there for us through all our hearts and all of our easies. He is through with us when we're repenting. He is there with us when we're celebrating. He is there with us when we are exercising our faith and he's there when, when we're ignoring him. He is there for us. And that's what I got from Nancy's conversation. I, she's just so excited to have a new level of relationship with Heavenly Father. And I, leaving this conversation with her was uplifting. I, it was just so beautiful. I am so grateful for my new friend Nancy and for her example. And I love that about her too. That she was like, what I want to do is be the example. I love that. I just am so grateful. And that's what the gospel, if you live it the right way, can do for you. And I just hope you have a super wonderful, awesome day. Tribe of Testimonies is not sponsored by The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The music is a traditional hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, arranged and performed by Kyle Forsyth. I would love to hear from you. I would love to hear how this podcast is affecting you. And I'm always looking for guests. If you or someone you know would be a great guest, you can reach me at tribeoftestimonies at gmail.com.